how often do you pray? Other than as a part of worship here on Sundays, do you pray? Would you say that you have a prayer life, a devotional life, or not so much? No blame and no judgment here, just an inquiry. An inquiry I am currently making not just of you, but of myself. There's a song from my childhood church that says, if we ever needed the Lord, we sure do need him now, right now. Need God every day and every hour. Tough seasons in life like the one we are currently experiencing always causes me to take inventory of my spiritual life. How about you? My spiritual practices, they cause me to draw nearer to God. And the word in James 4, 8 says that when we draw nearer to God, God draws nearer to us. And I encourage you, church, that one way to draw nearer to God is through a devoted prayer life. Prayer is something that we toss around quite ha haphazardly. When someone shares bad news, we'll say, I'm praying for you. And then often we forget to pray. Now there are several emojis for prayer. The praying hands are a very popular emoji. You can change it to your skin tone before you post it on social media or on someone's is, is texting someone. It's very popular to send the prayer emoji these days. Elected officials will say they are praying for the families of victims of mass shootings and other tragedies. Thoughts and prayers is mocked as an unwelcome response to tragedy because many believe that it simply means that yet again nothing will be done. Yet prayer is a key part of our faith. As Christians, we, this word says, we ought to always pray. After all, Jesus prayed. Jesus had a model prayer life. It was a serious matter for Jesus. And for me, that suggests that it ought to be a serious matter for us. And there's never a better time than the current time to take inventory of one's spiritual practices and even to discover something new about an old practice or an old tradition. And the lectionary meets us right where we need to be today with the gospel text. John 11, 1 through 13 is a wonderful lesson by Jesus on prayer. The first three words of today's scripture, which are, he was praying, are for me among the most profound of this section of scripture. He was praying. Jesus was praying. In fact, not only was Jesus praying in this story, Jesus prayed often. The Gospel of Luke records Jesus praying in Luke 3 while in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. In Luke 5, which records a time of Jesus when he drew away to a desolate place to pray. Luke 6, before making a crucial decision, like who to call as disciples, Jesus first prayed. Jesus prayed publicly before feeding the 5,000. Jesus prayed privately in seclusion. Jesus prayed alone and Jesus prayed with his disciples. Jesus, the one we say we love, the one we call Savior, the one who we say we follow, trust, and obey. Jesus, the one who healed the sick and raised the dead, the one we believe has all power in his hands, prayed. And he prayed all the time. Let that resonate for a moment that Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed. And the disciples, at least one of them, picked up on Jesus' practice of prayer because in today's text, Jesus was praying. And after he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. What made this disciple ask Jesus to teach them to pray? Maybe it was that Jesus was a non-anxious presence. 
confident, sure, had wonderful character and power. Maybe the disciples simply noticed how much Jesus prayed and admired a devoted life. Whatever it was, at least one of the disciples noticed Jesus was committed to a practice of prayer, knew that John had taught his disciples to pray and wanted in on this practice that Jesus seemed to be so committed to. So first, in order to develop a prayer life, I believe we need what this disciple had in this moment, and that was a desire to have a prayer life. Maybe his desire is to be like Jesus, because every time he turns around, Jesus is praying. The point is, he wanted to learn to pray. But I didn't come here today to tell you to pray more because the disciples prayed or even because Jesus prayed. I came to ask you to assess how much you believe you need God. Because a deep devotional life, a deep prayer life, which will certainly aid us all, will only be sustained if you believe you deeply need God that you need God's wisdom, God's provision, God's care, God's protection, God's guidance and direction, that it is no longer just about church for you, but beyond church, you need God. That's why Jesus prayed, and that's what Jesus is teaching in the scripture today when the disciple says, Lord, teach us to pray. And that's just what Jesus taught him was how desperately we need God. Jesus did so by teaching more about God in this lesson. After being asked by Jesus, after being asked by the disciple, excuse me, teach us to pray, Jesus says, when you pray, say, Father, shall we finally deal with Father? Maybe just a little bit. For those of us who wrestle with and realize the harm done by the presence of patriarchy in the Bible and in the world, Jesus' reference to God as Father is problematic. For sure, patriarchy is problematic, and that is an understatement. Jesus, assuming the translations of the original text are accurate, says, Father, yet many of us know that God has male, female, and genderless attributes. Go back to Anna York's lesson on Genesis for the greatest lesson I've ever heard on gender and God. Thank you, Anna. If nothing else, we are all made in God's image and God's likeness. Retha with it more, if you please, but God is not simply male. For Jesus to start this lesson on prayer by referring to God as Father and in other places in the Gospel, he uses the term Abba before Father, a term expressing intimacy of the relationship. Jesus is doing just that, establishing that a posture of prayer is based on a relationship. A familiar relationship, an intimate familial relationship. And the first part of establishing a prayer life is to figure out what that relationship is for you that makes it meaningful enough for you to call on God. And meaningful enough for you to pray to God. In other words, who is God to you? Is God creator? And that's with why you reference God as creator God? Maybe you relate to God as mother God. The psalmist of Psalm 27 says, When my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Maybe the psalmist refers to God as mother, father, God. As much as I am a believer in inclusive language for God, I am just as much a believer in our freedom to have a relationship with God and to determine the nature of that relationship for ourselves. As Baptists, we call that soul freedom, one of the fragile freedoms of our faith. And if I know Jesus at all, 
I know that Jesus did not intend for us to legalistically refer to God as a man, nor to get stuck on God's gender, but to have an intimate relationship with God that would eventually define itself. For that's what relationships do. So I encourage you to draw near to God, come close to God, so that no one else can tell you how to refer to God. You will know for yourself. Jesus goes on to say, may your name be revered as holy, may your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to a time of trial. Jesus is in essence teaching about God and an intimate and transactional relationship with God in this verse from what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Jesus teaches that we need and ought to pray for God's kingdom, in other words, God's values and ethic of love to reign over this earth as it does not do that today. He's teaching us that we need God each day, every day, to nourish us physically and spiritually. We need God's forgiveness and that we need to forgive others. A sermon all by itself. And that we need God's guidance to keep us from temptation. Then being the great teacher that he is, Jesus offers a parable. Jesus says, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived. Catch the parable. And I have nothing to give my friend. Here we see Jesus offer a purpose for prayer. Right there in verse 6, Jesus tells a story about a friend who has shown up and the person asking has nothing to offer him. The friend wants to be hospitable, but doesn't have the means to care for his friends. Jesus sets for us a purpose for asking, a purpose for prayer, the desire to help someone else the desire to be hospitable, the desire to provide for someone else, the care for someone else's needs, the desire for a need to be met. He's already taught us in verse 3 to pray for our own selves, so don't get me wrong that it is perfectly correct and accurate to pray for yourself. But in the parable, Jesus sets up and asks for someone else. That we should ask for bread for ourselves and then for a friend that we can be the provider for the other. Having a consistent prayer life just might be contingent first upon having a deep need for God ourselves. And second, having the desire to be a source, a provision for someone else. That's not far-fetched, given that in my last sermon, the man asked Jesus how to get to heaven, how to gain eternal life. And Jesus told the parable about caring for the stranger on the side of the road, the one who has been stripped and left for dead. Get this quickly. Jesus is consistent when he teaches that this life of faith is not just about God taking care of us, but about God using us to help take care of someone else. Jesus is still teaching, and I'm still in the parable. Jesus says the friend who is being asked, in other words, the friend in the parable who represents God says, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Thank you, Jesus, for going there. How many times have you prayed and it seemed that God didn't open the door? Jesus is acknowledging that this indeed can happen when we pray, that when we pray there are times it will seem that God does not respond, or in the case of the parable, God responds and says no. 
That's not hard to believe when we watch the painful scenes playing out in the midst of mass shootings and other tragedies. It seems like God has said, I cannot get up and give you anything. Times when it feels like God is saying, you are on your own. Ever felt like that? Ever bold enough to admit you felt that God said, you're on your own? Jesus lifts that up in the parable. The disciples said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And Jesus is teaching not only the purpose of prayer, but here Jesus is teaching the problem with prayer. And the problem with prayer is that it can seem that God has either not heard or has said no. And in the midst of need, that's a problem. But thank God the parable is not done and neither is the master teacher. Jesus continues and says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything out of friendship, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. This word persistence seems to imply that the person asking keeps asking and the person being asked finally responds not because of friendship but because of persistence. But is it just persistence? The Greek word is anadeia. It, it, it's one of these words that biblical translators have found it difficult to find an English equivalent. The NRSV translates it as persistence. The NIV translates it as boldness. The Common English Bible, and I know some of the scholars who contributed to that translation, translates it as brashness which is defined as self-assertive in a rude, noisy, and overbearing way. When's the last time you prayed for a need for someone else, or even for yourself, in a persistent, bold, self-assertive, rude, noisy, overbearing way? Some of us have been taught, you better not talk to God like that. But Jesus said, the God, the parable, let me say the man in the parable responded to this brashness. The disciple asked, Lord, teach us to pray. And, and Jesus has taught about the purpose of prayer for ourselves and for meeting the needs of others. The problem of prayer, that sometimes it seems God says no. And what are we to do about that? We're to keep on praying with some boldness and some persistence and even self-assertive, rude, noisy, overbearing way. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. We need to meditate that on that for a while instead of getting discouraged when we feel like God hasn't heard us Jesus says go in even more keep on praying and now Jesus teaches about the promise of prayer he says so I say to you in verse 9 ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives. And everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. And I just wonder if anyone has ever experienced an answered prayer. Have you ever asked and it was given? Have you ever sought and you were able to find? Have you ever knocked and the door was open? Jesus is not done with the lesson. That would seem like the end, wouldn't it? That, you know, he's told us prayer can be problematic. It can seem like God's, you know, ignoring us, but keep praying. And then he says, you will receive, but he's not done. See, Jesus knows not only about the problem of prayer, Jesus knows about the problems of life. Verse 11, Jesus said, Is there anyone among you, if your child asked for a fish, would give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asked for an egg, would give a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask 
Jesus is telling the disciples, yes, to pray for the Holy Spirit. And it's the same Holy Spirit who revealed to me that Jesus knows about the harshness of life, that evil is indeed real, that sometimes we do get the snake in life. Jesus wants us to know God didn't send the snake. And sometimes we get the scorpion in life, even after praying, and Jesus wants us to know that God didn't send the scorpion. Jesus, who comes from a tradition where God sent the plague and even sent the death angel, tells his disciples, is there anyone among you, if your child asked you for something good, would give them something bad? Jesus is distinguishing between evil and God. And the Holy Spirit needs someone to know this today, that while life can bring sorrow, the snake may come and the scorpion may come. Listen to Jesus. God gives good gifts to his children, that even if the snake came, take heart, God didn't send the snake. And the scorpion may have come, but God didn't send the scorpion. Some bad theology has left people thinking, God took my child. When the reality is a bullet took the child. Some bad theology has left some people thinking that God took my spouse when in reality an illness or a disease took the spouse. There are people who have walked away from God because when evil touched their lives, bad things happened in their lives. Some bad teaching taught, kept them thinking God did it and God doesn't make Mistakes. You want to hear some bad theology, go to a few funerals every once in a while. Go to ones that, that aren't necessarily people that you know so that you're not so caught up in the emotion and hear the bad theology that comes across the microphone. But I thank God for Jesus today because in Jesus' lesson, Jesus distinguishes, first of all, he makes the point that evil is real, but it is distinguishable from God. And I pray that this frees someone today, but that it causes you to lean in on your relationship with God, because the more you don't understand, the more you should lean in and say, Lord, increase my faith. Lord, open my eyes and my heart. Lord, I need your wisdom. I need your guidance and your direction. Lord, I want to know you. You'll find that there's a new purpose for prayer to not only pray for yourself, but to pray for someone else, to pray for societal issues, for injustice, for the pain and suffering and the needs across this world. I pray that you realize there's a problem with prayer that God may not answer in an instant, that you may have to persist, and that you may have to get brash and bold, and that this is not a lack of faith, it is an act of faith. And I pray that you realize that evil is real and is distinguishable from God. Stop blaming God for all the bad stuff that happens and read the text that Jesus says, all that stuff ain't from God, if you can excuse my vernacular. I was at Promontory Point one day this past week meeting a friend who's currently bereaved. Um, her husband passed recently, and so we're going to be meeting every Thursday at Promontory Point just to kind of hang out and, and relax. And she shared with me that her pastor just implemented uh, um, choir rehearsal on Thursdays. If anybody was at Promontory Point on Thursday, you would have noticed fireflies. Anybody noticed swarms of fireflies this week in Hyde Park? They were all over Promontory Point. And she said, I know God sent these fireflies because I should be in choir rehearsal. And I said, I believe that God knows that you are healing from bereavement and that it is quite okay that you have a seat right here at the lake and refresh your soul. How about that, God? So we, we are taught to believe that if bad happened, God did it. But as a song I know says, it ain't necessarily so. Jesus ends with the promise that if you seek, 
you will find if you ask it will be given if you knock the door will be open Jesus closes with his teaching by saying that God will give the Holy Spirit to all who ask for it is the Holy Spirit who walks with us and talks with us the Holy Spirit who reveals the deep truths of God the Holy Spirit who comforts us and transforms us the Holy Spirit who guides us into action not just praying for those 793 victims of homicide in 2021, but that the Holy Spirit disturbs us enough that we will act with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In these days of trouble, take deeply, take inventory of just how deeply you need God. And if you're not there, and you're not relying on God, who are you relying on? I encourage you to reconsider your reliance on God. Know that the Holy Spirit is the gift of God and that prayer for the Holy Spirit will always be answered and is the source that we all need. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.